All right, thank you for the introduction. Oh, does this work? Can everyone hear me? Cool. So the purpose of this work is we want to try and construct an obfuscation scheme that we can prove from standard assumptions without coming up with something new. And we'll try and do this for a more limited function class that will still be non-trivial to obfuscate. So why do, we, why do we care about obfuscation? Right? Suppose you've written some amazing piece of code and you want everyone to run it, and you know, maybe it'll reduce carbon emissions and help save the environment. The problem is within your code, maybe you have like a cryptographic secret key, and you don't want people to read a part of your code and learn something from that. So an obfuscation scheme will do something like the following. We'll take this and then return code that is guaranteed so that you can only treat it as a black box. Right? We want the user to only get input, output, query, access to the code. And if I run any algorithm that does a partial evaluation or tries to read some bits of memory, this should just give you a randomness that you could otherwise simulate without seeing the code itself. So if you could do this for any arbitrary fixed function, this is the standard notion of virtual black box obfuscation. Now, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, this is not possible in general for all circuits, but it is still possible for maybe some limited function classes such as point functions. So as the previous work, uh, talk was mentioned, like most of the follow-up work on obfuscation has been on trying to come up with a weaker notion of obfuscation, I.O., and trying to do this for general circuits. So we're gonna sort of take the opposite direction in this work, and we're gonna ask the question, you know, let's say we start from VV for point functions. What's the uh, most complex function class that we can still obfuscate from something like VVV without coming up with a new assumption? So specifically, uh, we're gonna use the notion of distributional VVB, and we're gonna look at the following function class, which we call pattern matching with wildcards. So here's how the function class works, right? So it's, you have, uh, let's say you're trying to evaluate your input on an n-dimensional uh, Boolean vector. So a pattern is going to be an n-dimensional uh, length n string where the character set is zero, one, or star. So if we didn't have the star character, this is exactly a point function. It outputs one if it agrees with the zero or one on the input. Now with the star character, we essentially ignore the dimensions that are stars. So you can think of it as projecting out those dimensions and then just doing a point function of the remaining. And importantly, we want W, the number of wildcards, to be large, to be a constant fraction. Right? If W was small, then this would just be a union of like two point functions and I wouldn't be standing here talking. So here's an example, right? Let's say for a length six, you have zero, one, star, star, zero, one is your pattern, right? So any input that agrees with the first two or last two bits is gonna be one. It doesn't matter what the middle two bits are. But if you, if you have one in the first bit, then this is gonna output zero. So hopefully function class is clear. Okay, so uh, just some possible applications of why this function class might be useful. Suppose, right, you suppose you're trying to check uh, code for a security flaw, and the non-wildcard slots sort of indicate where the security flaw is. So if a person has that security flaw, you want them to be able to detect it in the code, but you don't want to tell everyone where the non-wildcard slots are, because then everyone else who does not already have this problem can then go and try and look for it. So this function class was previously studied under the name of obfuscating conjunctions. And in the past, the uh, schemes were constructed based on multilinear maps and based on something called the entropic LW assumption. So we wanna get an obfuscation scheme for the same function class, but just in the generic group model. So on one hand, this, the assumption will be easy to understand. On the other hand, the construction itself will be much simpler to describe and implement because it will essentially just be computing some number and exponentiating it using a group oracle and then multiplying those. So the definition of security that we're gonna use is distributional VBB. So as I mentioned earlier, VBB was for if we could fix any function and then obfuscate it. So here instead, the function itself, we're gonna allow that to be sampled. So let me just say specifically what this is for our function class, right? We have this pattern sigma of zero, one star. So you can imagine some sampling scheme of how I sample this length and st string. You can sample each character slot individually from the uh, three possible choices independently. You could fix the number of wildcard slots and sample a subset, whatever you want to, however you want to sample it. So then we have this joint distribution over both the sampling, the function, and over the obfuscator's randomness. And we want to say that the, with probability over this joint distribution, this whole thing can be simulated. So we're going to we'll construct an explicit simulator which runs the adversary's 
uh, algorithm on something that represents a zero function. So what this says is that if you have this uh, pattern, and a priori you don't know what the pattern is, then this should behave to any adversarial algorithm A, this should behave just like something that is always zero, that never has an accepting input. So the proof of security of this is going to be in a generic group model. So the way this is set up is the following. Right? So let's say again we're trying to evaluate a length n input. And each, in each uh, x0 through xn has two possible slots. Right? So we'll start off by giving a table of two n handles. You can think of these handles as just being arbitrary strings in a space that's large enough that there's no collisions. And these handles will not have any meaning themselves except for interacting with the generic group oracle. So the group oracle itself is going to have some underlying group. It could be a cyclic group. It could be an integer ring of polynomials. And so it'll have a, it, so the group oracle will initialize a random embedding from this group into the space of handles. And so the interaction is modeled as the following. You can give the group oracle two of these elements, and it'll compute the product in its internal representation and give you a handle corresponding to that product. So if you've never seen this handle before, if it's, for example, if I took two of the table elements and computed something that was not in the table, then that, that new handle element should be uniformly distributed in the space H. So this is the model for the generic group. Now, the way we want to think about a proper computation of a function in this model is the following, right? We set up this table with all the possible bit values. So in order to evaluate an input x, we're going to choose the handles that are indicated by the input. So if x0 was 1, then we're going to choose h0, 1. Do this for each input, you get n handles, and then we're going to do some computation over these n handles that will tell us the output value. So how do we do this computation? So this differs from a point function in sort of this following symmetry, right? Let's say the pattern is 0, 1 star. The first two coordinates are just same as a point function. But on the third corner, we want these two handles to look the same when we compute the whole function. It shouldn't matter which one you choose. But on the other hand, they can't actually be identical before you complete the entire function evaluation, because then the adversary would be able to see that this is a wildcard slot. So the solution to, that we're going to use for this is the standard technique of polynomial interpolation. Right? So it doesn't matter which samples you get, as long as all of them are n unique samples, you can construct the same interpolating polynomial. So the setup is the following. We'll sample a polynomial such that p of 0 is 0. So you can sample this by just sampling the coefficients for the first to the nth terms and then constructing a polynomial as a sum like this. And then the way we're going to initialize that table of two n handles is as follows. So first, let's say we have a, for the slots that are not supposed to be accepting, right? So it's for 0, 1 star, if x0 was 1, then we'd never want this to be part of an accepting input. So for that slot, we're going to give a completely random group element and then give the mapping from that to the handle space. So r here represents just an independently sampled random group element. For the slots that are part of an accepting input, we're going to give it a unique sample from the polynomial. And so the inputs of the polynomial is just going to be this index that you can compute beforehand just by looking at the table. So here is this pi plus 2i plus j. So we'll do this for both the non-wildcard slots and for the wildcard slots. Right? These will all be generated in the same way. So then once you have this table, what then we can follow our previous evaluation scheme, pick the samples, construct the interpolating polynomial, and then We'll just say, you know, if this out, if p hat the in, interpolating polynomial evaluates to zero on the input zero, then we'll just output one. So this corresponds to if all my samples were legitimate uh, samples from the polynomial, as opposed to if I had a completely random sample, then p of zero would not be zero. So this doesn't work obviously because uh, so you can think of this as. I, I had this table of two n samples, but there's actually more than n samples. So you don't. So an adversary could try and figure out the extra samples that he's not supposed to do under an honest evaluation. And so there's these decoding attacks where read Solomon codes with noisy samples. For example, the Brillouin Welch algorithm, where if the num in this case, if the number of wildcard slots was greater than n over two, 
you could construct an error polynomial and solve for that and figure out the distinction between the slots. So we can't release the scheme like that quite yet. But so one thing to note is that the Berlekamp Welsh algorithm requires a nonlinear comp uh, computation because you're actually multiplying this interpolating polynomial by other algebraic uh, terms. However, as we'll show next, if you, want, if you just want to compute the value of the interpolating polynomial on zero, this only requires a linear combination over the, over the elements. So, in order, so with this realization, we can just put everything in the exponent as follows. So we'll sample the same degree n polynomial in the same way, but then we'll also fix a cyclic group of the same prime order as the modulus of the integer ring. Right, so that's the setup, and then this, the way you give the handles will be the same as before, we just put everything in the exponent of this same generator element. Okay, so now that we have this, how do we do this linear combination computation to evaluate the polynomial interpolant? Well, you can think of polynomial interpolation as a linear combination of basis elements, and because our inputs are 2i plus j, and then we also only have value to evaluate it on the term zero. We don't really care about what the interpolating polynomial is and everything else. We can just plug in all these terms and get a single number out of them. And we call this a Lagrange coefficient. So then we're just computing a sum over Lagrange coefficients, which is just the product over the, which is just the sum in the exponent, which we can compute as a product of these generic group elements. So for correct, yeah, so for correctness then, if each thing is a sample, then you'll see that in the exponent you get the sum of the CI Lagrange coefficient times the uh, value of the polynomial. And so this is going to give you g to the p of zero. And so if p of zero is the correct polynomial, then this will show you that the scheme gives you the correct output. And, but then if any of them was random, then you'll just, gonna, you'll just get a product with a random group element. So, so the correctness of the scheme is pretty straightforward. Now, we're going to show security of this through the following game between the generic group simulators, right? So the proof of this will be, a, so I'll go through the high-level proof of how we set up the generic group arguments. So we can think of uh, this proof will be a hybrid over the actual internal group representation of each oracle, right? So for the first one that we're going to start with is the actual implementation. This will be the cyclic group of order p. So a group element will look like this. It'll actually be g to the some p of some polynomial. The group that we're going to end with is going to be this thing which represents the zero function. Now, what is that? That's going to be a group over, that's going to be a free group over two n basis elements. Right? So the reason this represents the zero function is because each basis element here is going to correspond to one handle. So any linear combination of that is never going to be zero because these are all independent elements with no relations. So then any adversary trying to construct an interpolation over this group will always get something non-zero. So this represents the zero function. So this is the simulator E for N. Now, we also have, now we'll have a third simulator in the middle, which is sort of like an algebraic hybrid between these two. So for this last simulator, remember earlier we sampled the polynomial by sampling coefficients a1 through an? Here we're going to leave those coefficients unsampled. So this will be a polynomial ring over the coefficients a1 through an, and then we'll also have variables for each uh, non-accepting slot. Right? So we had n accepting slots plus w wildcard slots, so there's n minus w non-accepting slots. Each of those gets its own variable b1. So the initial handle table will look like this, right? So P of three will be this algebra, uh, polynomial of three A1 plus A9. And if you had a non-accepting slot, then it would just be its own independent free variable B1. So this is uh, what the three internal group representations will look like in our proof. Now, how do we show indistinguishability between any two of them? So I'll just, so for the rest of this, I'm just gonna focus on the in the distinguishability game between S and M, right, the first two. And you can think of the game between the second step as roughly similar. So proofs in the generic group model in the past have been sort of difficult to formalize because there's a lot of things you need to keep track of. You need to keep track of handles, how these correspond to group elements. And you also need to formalize this notion of, you know, what does it mean for a generic, two generic group simulators to differ? And, 
in the past, a lot of this has just been formalized as, you know, the simulation is perfect except if this happens. So we'd like to make that statement a bit more rigorous. So we're going to define a security game as follows. So the adversary is given two oracles. One of them you know. It's the, well, here we'll say it's the middle oracle with the Z adjoint AB polynomial representation. The other oracle is going to be either S or N with probability half. And the goal of this game is to guess which one that is. So the adversary is going to start off with the table from each one, and you're going to, and each round he asks the same query to each oracle. And the adversary wins if he can guess correctly the identity of what the unknown oracle is. Okay, so how do we, okay, so what do we need to define this game, right? We had these two different group representations. One was a polynomial, Z adjoint AB. One was the actual group. So it turns out that in order to make this game work, there is a relationship between these two, which is exactly the evaluation map, in which you take the polynomial and plug in the values that were actually sampled in the simulator's start. And so this gives you a group homomorphism from the group in the simulator M to the group in the simulator S. So we have this evaluation map, I'll denote it phi. Now, I do need to establish some notation just to keep track of the rest of the bookkeeping. So let's say that we have these two handle sets, right? We had an adversary playing two oracles simultaneously. So I have two handle sets, and so H, H superscript zero is just the initial table of the two end handles. And as each round, as the adversary asks a product and gets a new handle, he'll keep adding it to this set. And in order to uh, make precise the notion of asking the same query, we'll have this other map that identifies between the two sets, right? So initially, this will correspond to just the same entry in one table maps to the same entry in the other table. And then if I ask a query and get this uh, new pair of handles from each one, that will be added to this map. And then lastly, each, each group simulator will have its own embedding, its own sampled fixed random embedding from the group into the space of handles. Okay, so the proof is going to be a proof by induction. And so the idea is follows. Let's say the adversary has made T queries so far and has these two sets of T handles. Okay, now first I want to formalize, you know, what does it mean that the answers I've seen so far are the same? So that's going to be either I see one handle from each, and I already knew that psi of one mapped to psi of another. So I've seen both handles, and I know that one maps to another. Then that means this is the same answer. The other option is if both are new handles. And so because these are each phi is a random embedding, then these new handles will both be drawn from a uniform distribution over the handle space. So in this case, we'll also say that the uh, query output from the two simulators are the same. So we want this to be true for every query. And if that's the case, then we can say this game is uh, indistinguishable. But we also need another condition in order to show that this is true. And so this condition is that right, we had this non-trivial kernel from the polynomial ring Z adjoint AB to the group. And because this kernel is non-trivial, there's multiple things that map down. But we want there to only be one that the adversary has seen so far in the handle space of M. So, the, so what this is saying is, let's say we get a handle in the handle space of S. There is a unique polynomial which corresponds to a handle you've seen in M which maps to this. Okay, so this will be an inductive hypothesis. Now, given these two things, let's look at what a round in this game looks like. A round of simulation, let's say we've done T rounds on the T plus one round. The adversary will want to ask a group query of say H1, H2 to simulator M, and then the same corresponding one to simulator S, which will be defined by the sign map. And he'll get back two handles, one from each, okay? So we have, we have basically four cases here. These two handles can be the same that you've seen already. They can both be different, or one can be different, and one can be one that you've seen already. So one of these cases is impossible. Two of them are already will still satisfy the inductive hypothesis, and there's only one problematic, and we can show that there's only one problematic case, which is that if you get a new handle in the simulator corresponding to the Z adjoint AB polynomial ring, but you get one that you already seen already corresponding to the simulator in the generic group. All right, so then basically this comes down to an algebraic argument. We can show that the only way this is, happens is if you get something in the kernel of this map, in this evaluation map that's, that's non-trivial. And so once you get to this step, then 
the rest is uh, combinatorial calculations. So we can apply the same argument to both of the games. So, right, so the evaluation map here I've defined is just for S to M, but you can define a different evaluation map from M to E, which evaluates on the uh, random entry, you know, on different random entries. So, so this is uh, also, so this is a high level overview of this uh, framework that we give for the arguing in the generic group model. And I will spare you all the combinatorics details. So to conclude, uh, we give an obfuscation scheme for this function class, and we're able to show it from a standard assumption, with just, which is just a generic group model. And this assumption itself is easy to describe. And you just, you're raising, you're computing this uh, rational number outside of the group, and then you're exponentially using the group oracle. And so we also give this new framework for how you can maybe more formally think about generic group arguments using the simultaneous oracle game and how you can more explicitly identify when a simulation fails in this generic group case. And uh, thanks for listening.